Larry Lee tonight, everybody. I'm good here. I'm good here. What a joy to be back. Amen. In the Northern California region. I felt the Holy Spirit so distinctly as you were leading worship. It, didn't you feel a sense of just absolute unity? And where there's unity, there's power and there's grace and there's all kinds of possibilities. Revelation. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would do something unique in your life tonight. People for years said, we knew that you went through Baptist University. I, I, and then you went through six years of Baptist Seminary. How did you do that? Being a spirit-filled, tongue-speaking believer. I said, well, all I did the first two years I was saved was read the red and pray for the power. And uh, I got out on that hill one night. I, I was a junior at Dallas Baptist University. And I said, Lord, I said, I want everything that's in that book. I don't care what it costs me. Now, let me tell you something. If I write a new book, it'll be called, it'll be called Dangerous Prayers. Because that's a dangerous prayer. I don't care what it costs me. And that's what I always told them when they came around my, off, around my uh, dorm room and said, we want what you got. I said, if I get these on you, you're going to get it. But let me tell you what it's going to cost you, because I remember when I said, I don't care what it costs me, I just want what I'm reading in the book of Acts. I want that power of the Spirit, and it doesn't matter to me. And the next thing I heard, I thought, I stopped myself, and I said, Lord, that's going to ruin my ministry. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, yes, that's going to ruin your ministry. But this is where my ministry starts in your life. And that was the beginning, beginning of it. And I was reading the red, as I said, the words of Jesus. And I was so convicted by the prayer life of Christ. How many know that he went from one place of prayer to the next place of prayer? And in between, he did his ministry. Rose up early in the morning, late at night, walking on water, prayed, and then went and raised Lazarus from the dead, all the way through to the Garden of Gethsemane. How many know he didn't just go crawl up on the cross? He prayed through, listen now, to the place of grace. When that place of grace hit him, no matter how they beat him, he endured such suffering that he didn't open his mouth until he said to the thief on the cross, today, he's praying for people. Still praying on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. But after he died, saying, Father, into your hands pray, I commend my spirit. Then he was raised from the dead after three days, and guess what? He ascended, and when he ascended, he put the blood that he had shed on the altar of God, and that blood is speaking for you tonight. Hey, I want to say it again. The blood of Jesus is speaking for you tonight. And that was the beginning of the revelation that God gave me in prayer. That book he just lifted up has now been in 21 languages for almost 35 years, and we can't outrun it. Amen. Been to over 60 nations trying to catch up to what God has done, and it just keeps going. And we have nothing behind us pushing us, nobody underwriting, nobody paying for it except Jesus. Amen. And he does a good job. I want to brag on him. But as I heard the blood speaking in a vision, I saw that blood hit that altar. And he was declaring the names of God. And I begin just to say, you are my righteousness. Amen. You are my sanctification. Hi there, baby. You are, my, you are my peace. I was hearing the blood speaking the Hebrew names, compound names of God. You are my healer, Jehovah Rapha. You are my provider. As the Hebrew says, it's not Jabra, it's Yeri. It's the Yah sound. But it means... That he sees what we have need of before we ask. Jahara. We say Jahara. Amen. You are my protector. You are my shepherd. I was hearing all these names. And before I knew what I was doing, I was hallowing his name. And the Lord had told me it was in the word. And I said, Lord, what good is that prayer? That's the Catholic's prayer. That's their prayer for penitence. And that's our prayer as Protestants or Evangelicals, Pentecostals. That's our prayer for weddings and funerals, but that's just a one line, 22 seconds. Of, I can say it. I can sing it in two minutes and 22 seconds. What good is that? He said, say it very slowly. 
When I said it slowly, I saw in an open vision that blood hitting that altar. And as I began to praise him for what I was hearing, I entered his gates. And I forgot that the Bible says, having therefore, brethren, boldness, we enter the holy of holies, not by how much carpet we eat, not by how earnest we may sound when we pray, but we enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. How do you get into the Holy of Holies? Not by your confessionism, but by confessing what the blood is confessing because Jesus is praying over that same blood for you right now. For He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not going to preach long, but I will preach strong. Be seated if you will, please. Thank you so much for your incredible... Fellowship, Pastor, thank you for welcoming us into this building. Welcoming my dear friend now for I don't know how many years, 35 years or so, Dick and Carla Burnell. We thank you for the worship and the fellowship and the food and everything tonight. I want to say that once you get in His presence, you don't get in His presence just to be in His presence, although that would be good enough. But you get there to do kingdom business. Now watch this. Come kingdom of God. That's how the Greek language says it. It's like a man putting his foot down saying nothing but the kingdom of God. Be done will of God. A man putting his foot down saying I will have nothing but the will of God done today in my life. Are you following that? How many believe that? How many of you know that God didn't wake up this morning and look down at you and say well I wonder what I'm going to do with him today. No he's already predestined if you will. He has already foreordained the steps that you're to walk in, but he's waiting to hear your voice. And I challenge you to seek ye first the kingdom of God. And by the way, that's not a theological or or some sort of an ethereal spiritual idea. No, because the next verse says, take no thought for the morrow. In other words, when he says, seek ye first, he means do it first. How How many of you, if you don't pray first thing in the morning, you find yourself scrambling during the day? Trying to pray something through. So I declare it with my wife as we walk every morning. We take our walk, and she's here on the front row going on 24 years. Leah, stand and wave at everybody. I want want you to know, wave, wave, (laughs) that the Lord saved me, but he didn't blind me. (laughs) Glory to God. And so I pray that over my family and my church. I like to put it into alliteration like this. Every part of the prayer meets a specific need of your life. And we have written it off as some just ritualistic prayer. Can I just tell you it's not? When I went through seminary, the professors would put an outline up on the board or give it to us. Keep on running, honey. I may start following you. Amen. (laughs) I may just run with you here in a minute. but (laughs) But the professors would put an outline up there, and then they would give the points under the outline. With your internet, you can put one word up and you can study for four days on that one word. So there's the paternal part of the prayer. How many of you need to know God is your heavenly Father? There's the presence part of the prayer, entering His gates with thanksgiving in your heart, but thanksgiving for what the blood is speaking, because that's how you enter the Holy of Holies, according to Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, the Bible says we find grace to help we know the grace is sufficient but as we enter his presence we experience the all-sufficient grace of God and that grace is greater than all our sin and all our need don't you love him tonight boy the sweetest faces I tell you I see so many people smiling at me right now seems like some of y'all already know this amen How many have ever done this before or heard this before? I know Rick has because I preached it in his dad's church many years ago. But I never get tired of it because, again, you know, people smarter than Jesus make me nervous. (laughs) I told a guy that was a great big, big, well-known evangelist. He was on an elevator with me. He started tapping me. He said, I don't need your prayer teaching. I don't need your prayer. And he, you know. It was all right until he sort of hit me on the shoulder a little harder. And then I realized I had an attitude problem on my hand. And I looked up at him and said, he said, I don't need your prayer teacher. I said, you know, people smarter than Jesus make me really nervous. Because it wasn't Larry Lee that said, after this manner, therefore pray ye. 
And after this manner, the word manner means pattern, outline. And so Jesus gave a prayer line. You can't, he gave a prayer outline you cannot improve on. And he gave it in the beginning of his ministry. And most of us, it's Jesus came to you face to face. And how many believe this word is just as powerful right now as it was when God allowed it to be written? And so if Jesus came one time to you and said, now listen, called you by name and said, this is your outline. Use it when you pray. And meditate on what the blood has done because the blood bought you entrance into the paternal nature of God your Father. Brought you entrance into the Holy of Holies as you hallow His name. Gives you the right to declare nothing but the kingdom of God. Nothing but the will of God be done. And then, how many of you know that you have been redeemed from the curse of the law? I was preaching one night and I said the curse of the law is, the Bible says the curse of the law is the curse of having falling shorts. It's always you're falling short. And before I knew what I'd done, I had people looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, you know, the curse of the law, the curse of the law tells us that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I mean, glad that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And so he has made provision for us, not just the paternal part, not just the presence part, but we get in his presence to establish the priority part. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come. Then there's the provision or the prosperity part. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of you will say amen that he's still an excellent bread maker? And then there's the pardon part of the prayer. Forgive me as I forgive those who trespass against me. Then there's the power part of the prayer. Deliver me from the evil one. And right there we put on our armor and we say, thank you, Lord. You are my truth. He's already in us. Amen. So putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is putting on the whole armor of God because He is my truth, breastplate, He is my righteousness, feet shod with the preparation, that means readiness. He is the ever ready one, amen. He's ready when we're not ready and usually we're not ready in the flesh, but He's always ready. Take a shield of faith, our faith is in Him, but ladies and gentlemen, our faith is by Him too because faith cometh. He is our helmet of salvation. He is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And He is the prayer language of the Holy Spirit in your mouth. That's seven pieces of that armor you just learned to put on the Lord Jesus. And you walk out. And when they walk out, you're walking out in Jesus. And the devil can't tell if it's you or Jesus walking down the street. I just share with you, this is how I've prayed now. Since the time I was under such conviction going all the way through college, our youth group grew to over a thousand people, Pastor Rick. Such a great move of God during those, those early years of preaching. But when they offered me the church, as our pastor got suddenly ill and died, the church, that, when we went there, had 400. When he died, there was 5,000, and over 1,500 of them were my young people. And they, they said to me, they said, we'd love for you to come and take this church, but we, we'll let you be our pastor, but uh, we'll let you be our preacher, but we don't want you to be our pastor. You're too young. You'll turn it into a youth church. Now everybody wants the young people, amen. Long story short, I said no because my preaching life is not commensurate with my prayer life. So for 18 months, I went away to a solitary place, 18 months, 5 a.m. in the morning, until this revelation came one morning when I saw the blood hit that altar and I heard him speaking, I am your righteousness. And I began just to agree with him. And how many of you know that prayer is just basically agreeing with God out loud? When you pray, say. That was at the end of his ministry. For most of us, he would have just had to say it once. But when they heard him praying in Luke 11, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, say. But he didn't give a new outline. He gave the very same outline that he gave in Matthew 6 as in Luke 11. So Jesus said it twice, and that's enough for me. Amen. And I just challenge you to take that little bit of teaching and allow it to begin to teach you. I call it the prayer that teaches us how to pray. Because as you do that, you'll find that God really is a miracle-working God. Every part of the prayer meets a specific need, not according to your need, but according to His riches. I mean, those are great, a great gap. 
between your need and his riches in glory. And so finally, after that 18-month period of time, the Lord led me to a little bitty town called Rockwall, Texas. I'm going to share a little testimony here. I pulled into that little town 35 miles east of Dallas, and there's one blinking light, one Sonic, and one junior high and high school, and it was a tiny little town of less than 5,000. And the Lord said, go right here. I'm going to establish my people right here. And he said, you're going to see my hand right here. Well, we started in a home, like Pastor Dick said, he did. From the home, we went to the back room of the skating rink. I was preaching in the back room of the skating rink. We were praying, oh, Holy Spirit, fall on us tonight. And I, I heard a lady out in the congregation go, ah, screaming to the top of her lungs. I said, oh, thank God, it's the Holy Ghost. It was not. It was a Texas-sized rat running on the rafter <laughs> right behind my head, about this big. True story. And so we became quite famous as in the bowling, from the bowling alley as Rockwall's original Holy Rollers. And there we were, and we finally made it to the cafetorium of the high school, and the chief of police called me. We had 800 people by now. We were going. We were the largest church in town within two and a half, three years. Chief of police calls, and he said, now look, Larry, he said, there's a cowboy in town that you want to look out for. His name's Dwayne Ray. He said, now, Dwayne is an interesting character. He rides rodeo. He rides in the rodeo. He really is a bull rider. Well, he's a fireman by profession, but he makes his living as a professional bull rider. But he's got one little problem. I said, what's that? He said, he loves to get in fights, and mainly he likes to beat up preachers. <laughs> and I said, must have had a little problem in Sunday school. And he said, yeah, I had more than that, looks like. But if he comes in the back of your church, you'll know him when you see him. And boy, one Sunday morning, I look up, and I had no doubt about who he was. Boy, he had that red, drawn face, of cowboy-looking cowboy hat, walked in, sat on the back row. If I told everybody to sit down, he would stand up and stare at me. How many of you know ever got that look from one of those good old boys? Well, if you hadn't, you hadn't lived. Amen. And there, I'd say, everybody sit down, he'd stand up. If I say stand up, he'd sit down. And, and he stayed for a few weeks, and I thought he would just come and go. But one night on a Wednesday night, he laid for me. And he was out behind one of the little pillars there at the high school, and he said, hey. I look around, and there's Dwayne Ray staring right at me, and I was by myself. He said, you want to go out to the truck with me? And I said, I've been out to the truck with some good old boys like you before. And it never turned out right for me because I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. I love people. I love people. I'm not. But if Daddy didn't raise a coward, so I'll go out with you. When we get out there, he opens the front door of his truck or the side door of his truck. He said, there it is. You, I figured out you're either straight from heaven or straight from hell, and you're not anywhere in between. But you're going to be my pastor because I'm going to get saved next Sunday morning in your church. <laughs> and I was trying to be <clears throat> I was trying to be all macho and masculine and sound like, you know, the man of God, and my voice cracked. I said, well, he said, well, look down in there. I said, well, what is it? I mean, what is it? What is it? He said, well, look in there. He said, that's my tithe. He said, I learned when I was a little boy, you can't, you can't rob God and get along in this world. So I took it home and got our elders together, and we counted the $1,600, $1,700, amazing and the next Sunday, while he's getting saved in the altar, I'm telling the people, now this guy right here that's getting saved, he brought me this old workbook right here. And I said, it's an amazing story. And everybody knew, everybody in the county knew Dwayne Ray. He was quite famous for beating up preachers. And uh, I said, he's going to be a member of this church, whether you like it or not. We're going to love the devil out of him if we have to. Be that as it may, I dropped the boot in the altar, and people started coming up and putting money in that boot. We were meeting in a cafetorium, and within a year, I had seen a, a piece of land, 50 acres, right on Interstate 30 between Dallas and Texarkana, going straight north. And I, I said, Lord, I want that piece of land. And somebody put a wood cross out on the land, and with a magic marker, wrote a number. And I called it. I told the guy, I said, Look, how would you like 
to have the greatest church in the state of Texas built on your land. He said, I don't care a thing about church. I'm a backslidden Church of Christ deacon. He said, I just want the money. I said, well, how much do you need? And he quoted me an astronomical figure. But he said, all I need is X number of dollars down. And it was a big number. And uh, I called him back. I said, can you give me three weeks? And I kept dropping the boot in the altar. And people kept putting money in the boot. And Pastor Dick, not all you brothers. I'm going to tell you, God can do things that you can't do. Amen. Because in three weeks, we had the down payment. And we bought the land, and we built our first building, and owned the land debt-free, 50 acres. Building paid off, first building paid for. And I've always said we didn't build by the bank, we built by the boot. <laughs> and so we saw the hand of God. And 10 years later, after I'd resigned the church, the Lord had called me out of a vision he said, if you'll give me this church, I was there for a full 11 years in a town that had 5,000. People were coming from the north, south, east, and west. We had over 10,000 members in a, in a beautiful Coliseum-type auditorium that would, had 5,000 folding chairs, and in the back, the back walls could collapse to 10,000. Dr. Cho preached there many times. It was an amazing move of the Holy Spirit. 460 home care groups. The Spirit of God was just, had taken over. And all I was doing was just going, golly, look at this. I mean, it was a look what God is doing. Because all I was doing was pray and obey. And the Lord was doing the rest. And in the vision, I saw a man who couldn't get through a door. I'd been there 11 years. I felt like I'd be there all my life. And a man kicked the door in the vision. He hit the door with his shoulder. Couldn't open it. He kept working on the door. To open. Wouldn't open. I said, Lord, why won't the door open? He said, because there's no anointing on his prayer life. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, tell them to forget their past. Pray in their present like you teach prayer. And don't be afraid to obey in the future. Didn't he say, remember not the former things, Isaiah 43, 18? Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. That's the present. Shall you not know it? It's a good question. You can't miss it. For I will make a way in your wilderness and rivers to run in your desert. In other words, there's a hallelujah for the past. Don't. It's working for your good. There's a hallelujah for your present. Because he said, behold, I'm doing new things. Hallelujah. Can I just go ahead and tell you, God's doing a new thing in my life right now. Pastor Dick prophesied about it tonight. But this prayer ministry that's been to over 60 nations now, we've seen miracles that are beyond anything that anyone can hardly believe when we tell them. Throwing my coat over a kid in the Dominican Republic that was the Helen Keller child recognized by all the pastors in the crusade. Say the little Helen Keller child spoke that night and saw and heard. Was called to go to Jakarta, Indonesia by a billionaire to teach in his Bible college. And I said, I won't come unless you bring all of the denominational leaders from Pentecostals to Presbyterians to Catholics. I want them all on the platform. He said, they've never come together. I said, well, then I'm not coming because y'all are in the middle of civil war. It was right after Suharto went out and Abibi was the interim president. He said, well, they won't do it. I said, Call him. He called me back in, in, in 24 hours. He called me back. And he said, I don't know what you've been doing over there in your prayer room, but they all said yes. I flew into Jakarta, and there they were in a 15,000-seat auditorium. And I get there ready to preach. I'm on the platform. The Lord said, don't preach. Now, that's strange. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, get a big bucket. And tell all the preachers, there's about 50 of them, take their shoes and their socks off and pull their trousers up to their knees. And I got on my knees and I prayed over every one of their feet. I washed their feet. The next night I preached and 3,000 were saved. Then at 4 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the, the interim president of Indonesia. He says, I've been watching you on closed circuit television. And our imam says he wants you to come and 
receive a de declaration in the in our what they would call our White House, if you will, Capitol building. We have never had a a a Christian preacher in here. I said I'll only come if I can bring the prophets with me, and I took a whole group of prophets in there with me. We got in there, and all of a sudden he got up, started to read, and he started to shake. And he finally dropped the piece of paper. The Holy Ghost hit him like you cannot believe. He said, I have to say in the name of your Lord Jesus Christ, Father, forgive us. We knew not what we did. We killed your pastors. We raped your women. We burned down your churches. I beg for your forgiveness. The prophets began to thunder out over him. And then all of a sudden, the, pre the Christians and the Muslims did something that was against the law, frankly. They started hugging and loving each other. And the next morning, amen. And the next morning, uh, in the newspaper, it was written by the imam, the leader of the Muslim faith of the whole nation of Indonesia. These words, greatest prayer meeting ever conducted in the nation of Indonesia. The war was settled after that. I preached that next night, 3,000 more got saved. And I just want to say to you guys, I'm just as comfortable preaching to 30 as I am to 300 or 3,000 because my message is not about me. It's about what God has done. To God be the glory. They were sneaking me out because the Civil War was still on at 4 in the morning that next day to get me out of the country because it was dangerous. And they said to me, they said, uh, do you want to go back to the, to the auditorium? I said, it's four in the morning. What's there? I said, the people have never left. They prayed all night long. Oh, God, give us a prayer meeting like that. Let the war stop. Let the disunity stop. Let the division stop in Jesus' name. Break it, O oh Lord, by the power of your authority and the unction of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned the cowboy that put the boot down there. Ten years later, he calls me. I hadn't talked to him in ten years, and he said, my daughter was T-boned by an 18-wheeler. She was driving her pickup, and her, she's in ICU at Parkland Hospital. Her kidneys have been severed into two, my God, into two pieces. She's bleeding out and keeps bleeding out. And uh, what do you say to me? I'm sorry? Yeah, oh, it's her liver was severed. Liver was severed into two pieces, and livers don't grow back together. And the doctors were telling him to take her off the life support. And he said, I won't do it till I speak to the man of God. He got me on the phone and said, Pastor, pray. Because they want me to take the, my precious daughter off life support. I said, call me back in 24 hours. So I got in my study that afternoon and I heard this word. Now you'll see the hand of God. And so the next day, 24 hours passes and he calls. And he said, what did the Lord tell you? I said, the Lord said we would see his hand. And all I heard was screaming, crying, weeping, praising. Sounded like a runaway Pentecostal revival. And I said, Dwayne, what happened? He said, the doctors went in after you prayed. And they said they saw what could only be described as what they call flanges, that is fingers, connecting the two pieces of the liver. They went back three hours later. There was less hand, and the, kid, and the liver was growing back together. And three hours later, the liver had completely grown back together. And when she served our steak at Saltgrass Steakhouse about three or four years later, she said, you don't know who I am, do you? She said, I'm the little girl who Jesus put his hand in my liver and healed me. I want to pray tonight. I told you I wasn't going to preach long. But I have preached strong. I want to pray the hand of God will come on every individual in this room. I want to pray the hand of God will come upon you in a way that that an unction of prayer will flow in and through your life to a, in a dimension that you've never known before. How many of you know he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think? 
the stair steps into the place of grace where you could even take a cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I want to pray the hand of God will come on your ministry, on your family, on your children. If you need the hand of God on any part of your personal life or on your body, would you stand and lift your hands to God? And let's stand together saying, Lord, here we are. Here we are, Lord, right now. Let me pray for you. Lord, you said knock, ask, seek, and knock. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And Lord, I ask for that prayer anointing as we say, Lord, we release our past. Say it out loud, Lord, I give you my past. It's working for my good. Hallelujah. I give you my present, O oh Lord. For I know you're doing a new thing. And I'll not be afraid to obey you in the future. I give you a hallelujah for my future. Everybody, hallelujah. 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 Father, thank you for the anointing that is breaking every yoke in this room right now. And that the hand of God that came on me when I went to that little tiny town would come on every individual in this room. Spirit, mind, emotions, body, children, family, ministry, and money. Whatever they need, Lord. Meet their needs. Not according to their needs, but according to your riches. In glory by Christ Jesus. We release the speaking of the blood right now. We release the speaking of the blood over you. The Lord is your righteousness right now. You don't have to measure up to your righteousness because it's already gone. His righteousness is all that matters tonight. You are my sanctifier, Lord. You are my peace. You are the one present. You are the healer. You are the provider, the protector. You are the shepherd. I come into your presence, Father, with thanksgiving for what the blood is speaking. And I want to thank you, Jesus, that you're praying right now. Can you just wave a hand at the Lord and say, thank you for praying for me, Jesus. Not according to my flesh, but according to the speaking of the blood. Now let me ask you as you look up at me for a moment. How many of you caught on to what I just said about praying through the prayer? How many believe you can do that? All of my children were doing this by the time they were five. And the youngest is 23 and the oldest is 48. They're all serving God today and they never walked away. Why? Because they raised them, we raised them the first thing in the morning. Declaring what the blood had done. And entering into the paternal presence of God and then moving how many believe you can do that amen hey I'm going to tell you do it in Jesus name because you can never improve on what Jesus taught about prayer thank you Lord for what you've done tonight in our hearts thank you for the great conviction of prayer your people are perishing not for a lack of sincerity but for a lack of knowledge let this revelation Go so deeply into their lives that they're never the same again. And we will always stand back and give you all the glory. One more time, lift your hands and say, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen and amen. Pastor, amen. Wow. Be seated, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was, uh, that was awesome. You know, prayer is something we are supposed to do. We should do. We do, but we don't do it enough. And 
most of us don't do it accurately or scripturally. And that's why I, I said uh, to Larry, you got to get that. We got to get that message back out. Any of you pastors would ever like Larry to, he's, he's only an hour flight away now to come to your church and release that prayer anointing. I'll do it. He'll do it. I mean, like, like we're, we're kind of at an interesting place in our lives. We both preached at the biggest churches in the world, and now we don't care. <laughs> I, dro- I drove down to Vacaville for 18 people because he's a good man. And we had church. And I, I preached for Dr. Cho 20 times. But it's just as important to the Lord. I'm going to ask you, uh, Larry, I don't want to get real personal, but uh, Larry had some serious downtime over the last 20 years with uh, cancer that in the natural really should have killed him. How many operations have you been through? Going through 13. 13 operations. A lot of uh, rebuilding, and, and we won't get into it, but uh, him just being alive and then got hit with diabetes and then COVID and then, I mean, everything the devil could do to kill this man. He tried. I'm talking physically. And it really hurt his ministry because he couldn't. And God bless, God bless Leah. I mean, she went to work and stood, stood by him and with him in the hospital all those months and months and months and months and just laid up and, and uh, just stood there right by her man. And it hit. You guys were only married 30 days when you got hit with cancer. That's right. Now, a lot of women would have just yeah. didn't, buy, didn't buy into this. But not this woman right here. We love you, Lee. We're very proud of you. You're a good woman. And you're married to a good man. Put up on the screen, Jess or whoever's back there, I can't see, of how to give to JLI. I think my daughter sent something over. Uh, eight, 18551, and there's a number. Or uh, like the Cardozas, they brought, a, they brought a check for you. Just before, I haven't said anything. They just said the Lord felt. And if, uh, so we're going to just leave these hats up here. <laughs> if you would like to put in something to help Larry's ministry, God bless you for that. And at least pray for him because I believe some new doors are going to open and he's got a he's got a heart he's got a heart for the Sacramento area like I do, and one of the reasons is Carl and I are here and we've been we've partnered together before some pretty crazy things, and it's like who knows what the future holds, and uh, Larry will be with me tomorrow uh, at the citywide gathering over in Fair Oaks, and I think Don's going to say something about you and introduce you to some of our friends, but uh, just bow your head and just ask the Lord if. You feel like you're supposed to give anything. It doesn't matter how much. Could be cash. Could be a check. Could be, could be something here. Again, not your tie. That belongs to this church right here. This is your church, or your whatever. Wherever. Listen, I pastored. I, I pastored for many years, and I know how important it is to have tithers keep things going. But if you have an offering you'd like to give the man of God, just bow your head and just ask the Lord. And I like what. Uh, Oral Roberts used to say, if you get two figures, the little one's the devil. <laughs> Is that oral or not? That's Oral Roberts. And then, of course, Sunday, pray for me. I'll be in Albuquerque at a, a new friend, Ray, I'm a graduate, Mike Schaefer. And then uh, we'll be back and, and uh, here in the area. And uh, looking forward to seeing more of you guys. And then uh, invite people to these Wednesday night services. They're going to be different because when I pastored, our Friday night service, I got witnesses here. Our Friday night services were different than our Sunday morning. Sunday morning was the crowd. It was our pastoral message. But Friday night, it was Katie bar the gate because anything, right, Joseph? Friday night was like, Holy Ghost, come on in here, come on in here and mess this place up. And let's get some people healed and delivered and turned on to the things of the kingdom. Well, Father, we thank you for blessing our dear friend, Dr. Lee. Lord, take this message that is so needed to the nations as the Lord opens doors. Big churches, little churches, crusades, camp meetings, house churches, Bible studies. He don't care. He don't care. I know he don't care. 
he, he is just ready now that he's healed and his body's strong again. He's ready to get out there and do the bidding of his Lord. Father, thank you for these precious people here tonight. Thank you for the generosity of Pastor Fred and Cindy to allow us to do this. And all our dear pastor friends, in Jesus' name. Let me just say this in closing. We're in Lincoln, California. There's Auburn, California. There's Mather, California. Now, these are not metropolitan major cities. If God can take this little old Baptist preacher and stick him in Rockwall, a town of less than 5,000 people, why can't he do it in Lincoln? Why can't he do it in... Uh, why can't he do it in Mather? Why can't he do it? Why not? He takes the foolish things to confound the wise. I think God gets a kick out of blowing people's minds. I'm sure he does. Yeah. Take an old iron worker like me, no pedigree. I knew, I knew all the hell's angels. I didn't know one preacher. And tells me to build a mega church in Silicon Valley. It's like, are you out of your mind? You got to be kidding. So God can do anything. Is that right, Sam? God can do anything. Well, God bless you. Come on up. And if you want to bless the man of God, shake his hand, tell him to love him. Don't forget, be in church somewhere Sunday morning. And we'll see you in a few weeks.